I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with John McDonough, a professor of public health practice at the Harvard School of Public Health. Professor McDonough has written a perspective article on budget sequestration and the U.S. healthcare sector. Professor McDonough, in your article, you lay out the cuts to health-related programs and the largest dollar amounts being cut from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Tell us how those cuts are distributed among CMS programs and what kinds of effects they might have. The first thing to understand is that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services is getting the largest cut because it's by far the largest program at about $577 billion in this fiscal year. The actual percent cuts to Medicare programs is only about 2%. And what's also important is that there are certain elements of the program, the Medicare program, that are off limits. So no cuts in terms of things that would raise premiums to beneficiaries or raise cost sharing. No cuts to the Medicare Part A hospital insurance trust fund. So the whole burden of those cuts will go on cuts in payments, reimbursement to providers, hospitals most importantly, physicians as well, unlike the Affordable Care Act, which didn't have any reductions in payments to physicians. The sequestration will hit the physician community at the same rate as the rest of the Medicare program, uh, Medicare Part C, Medicare Advantage. So there are cuts to all of the provider classes in the law, and that's the only part of the Medicare program that will, in fact, get directly affected by sequestration. In terms of percentage cuts, uh, the largest one is being applied to the National Institutes of Health, 8.2% across the board reductions plus $1.55 billion in additional cuts. Why was the NIH hit so hard? So understand that the sequestration for non-exempt, non-defense programs amounts to about 5% over the course of a year. The sequestration, though, starts on March 1st of this year, which is already passed and goes through the end of the federal fiscal year, which is the end of September. So 12 months of cuts over seven months of program operations. And so 5% in this year becomes over 8% because it's reduced to just seven months. So the NIH wasn't singled out or picked on. Other similar agencies like FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, they are also taking similar cuts. In the succeeding years after fiscal year 2013, the cuts for those agencies will be 5%. But because this is taking effect literally in the middle of the year, it will be over 8% instead of 5%. And what will that mean to the NIH? So for the NIH, it is a cut of about $1.5 billion out of about a $31 billion federal budget for this year. Uh, And of course, funding for NIH has been pretty flat over recent years after some pretty dramatic growth over the course of most of the last decade. But the impact of that will be uh, fewer awards will be put out and the awards will be smaller. And they haven't specified yet whether or not there will in fact be furloughs as is on the table in many, many other agencies. But the impact will be noticeable and it will be pretty soon. You mentioned that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will be looking at Uh, similar cuts. And in in your article, you lay out some of the resulting reductions, funding for diagnostic and preventive services, monitoring of disease outbreaks. Is there any expectation that private institutions, foundations, other players might pick up some of this slack? Not in any noticeable or significant way. There's been no indication of any entities coming forward. In fact, the cuts are not just at CDC. The cuts will cascade down to state, county, and local public health agencies. Normally, we would think that if there's a cut at the federal level, that those entities could pick up some of the slack. But one of the ways CDC will be implementing these reductions is through some pretty sharp reductions to their funding support for other layers of government. And that's where you would normally expect some kind of a safety net. And the safety net is being grabbed away as part of the overall reduction. A recent article in the New York Times described the sequester's effect on the Indian Health Service, which many experts thought would be protected by laws that 
were thought to prevent cuts of larger than 2%, but the Indian Health Service has been cut in sequestration by 5%. Do you know how that happened and, and what it will mean for Native Americans? So some of this is the interpretation of the finer points of language in the sequestration in terms of what gets interpreted at 2% and what gets interpreted at 5%. But the cuts will be severe. They're estimating a reduction of 3,000 fewer inpatient admissions funded by the services, as well as over 800,000 fewer outpatient procedures. That's 804 thousand uh, fewer procedures out of about 12.8 million. But it's a significant drop, and there's wide recognition that the Indian Health Service is significantly underfunded, uh, significantly stressed. It had a real advance in the Affordable Care Act with the first reauthorization of the Indian Health Services in about 12 years. However, uh, that was unfunded and left to future budget cycles to move up, and instead we're seeing it go in the other direction, which is a real tragedy. In another financial matter, the Senate has reached a deal on the continuing resolution, which extends last year's budget into this year, and that bill's now being considered in the House. What effect, when that passes, if it passes, would it have on funding for health-related agencies? Right. So the backdrop is that this year's fiscal budget, the fiscal year 13 federal budget, has been funded through what are known as CRs or continuing resolutions because there was no agreement on a broader budget framework. So it was rolling over last year's budget with just a small increase. And that's what was moving forward. And uh, apparently Congress is on the verge of agreeing on a new continuing resolution to fund the federal government for the rest of this fiscal year. So it appears that we will avoid some government shutdown in the middle of this year and the government will be okay until at least the end of September. The unfortunate news is that really this continuing resolution was a prime opportunity for Congress to go in and fix some of the harsher damage from the sequester and they're making a few minor tweaks but overall they are leaving the sequester damage pretty much in place and intact and this really seems like it is going to be one of the remaining windows of opportunity if not the last one to really reverse some of this damage before it goes too far and it appears that that's an opportunity that's been missed. In addition, the Senate and the House now both have proposed budgets for FY 2014. The Senate version repeals the sustainable growth rate formula that calculates the payments Medicare makes to physicians and also promises to find $275 billion in Medicare savings. How would that budget affect Medicare, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Program? So no significant impact on Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program, the significant changes would be in terms of Medicare. And the good news is that the Senate is determined, and we know there's interest in the House, in getting rid of this physician payment formula, the sustainable growth rate that has been a millstone around the necks of the physicians and physician community for about more than a decade now. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because of the deceleration in the rate of growth of Medicare spending over the past three years, way beyond anything that anyone saw, the cost of a 10-year repeal of the SGR, the sustainable growth rate, is now significantly lower than what had been estimated only a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, they thought that the 10-year cost, which is how you have to deal with anything in budget terms in Washington, D.C., was going to be over $300 billion over 10 years. And now the estimate is it will be about $138 billion. Now, $138 billion is still a lot of money. However, in Washington, D.C. terms, it's a much easier lift than over $300 billion. And there's a recognition as well that if they don't take advantage of this, relatively speaking, low cost to repeal SGR, it's not going to get cheaper to repeal in the future. It's going to get more expensive. And so this may be a really important window of opportunity to get rid of the SGR and replace it with something 
that will in fact make sense. So it's a good opportunity, and that's good news for the physician community. There is also in the Senate budget about $275 billion in other Medicare savings, and those are not specifically spelled out, but there is this sense between the administration, Health and Human Services, CMS, and in particularly an outside advocacy organization in Washington, D.C. called the Center for American Progress, which a few months ago came up with a cost savings agenda for the Medicare program that doesn't involve simply slashing payments to providers or harming beneficiaries, but really goes at trying to do documented improvements in increasing uh, productivity and, and finding sensible savings. So we'll see how that moves when, when the House and the Senate get together. But again, I think it's trying to look at this in a smarter way as opposed to just, let's just take some wild cuts at this thing. What about some of the agencies we've been talking about, NIH, CDC, FDA? How would they fare under the Senate's proposed budget? Well, they would, they would get modest increases, and at the same time, they would be continuing affected by the sequestration. The sequestration hits hard this year for seven months instead of 12 months, and it goes on at the same level for the next eight fiscal years. So we're talking about 2013 through 2021, equal amounts every year. So the dollar impact inflation adjusted is less. But every single year, FDA, CDC, NIH will be facing this 9% grab back because of sequestration unless Congress goes back and fixes this. And so this is going to be a significant problem. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, are estimating about 424,000 fewer HIV tests 50,000 fewer immunizations. They're looking at closing, shutting down the uh, National Healthcare Safety Network, which has been a innovative and really important national network to track healthcare-associated infections that's been doing some really important work at getting at this. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration is looking at 2,100 fewer food inspections of both domestic and foreign food. And you think about some of these reductions, some of these cuts, and if something goes wrong, and something always goes wrong, if you have, for example, some significant food outbreaks, uh, if you are catching fewer healthcare-associated infections because of this, the, the alleged savings can easily, very quickly, if things go awry, um, be overwhelmed by the adverse impact and the adverse cost to the healthcare system because government is not there doing the job at the level that we want and expect it to. On the House side, the proposed budget looks similar to what Representative Paul Ryan proposed last year. It would repeal the Affordable Care Act, turn Medicaid into a block grant program, and convert Medicare into a premium support program. What effect would changes like those have on healthcare spending, and are they likely to get farther than the House? Well, I think the sense is that they are not likely to get further than the House of Representatives. And it's also important to understand when they say they repeal the Affordable Care Act, there is one important piece that they don't repeal. And what they don't repeal are the savings, the reductions, the cuts, and the revenues in the Affordable Care Act to pay for the Affordable Care Act. So in the presidential campaign, uh, uh, the presidential candidate Mitt Romney and his running mate, Congressman Paul Ryan, were castigating the Affordable Care Act for cutting the rate of growth of Medicare spending by $718 billion over the 10-year period of the law. In Congressman Ryan's budget, which the House has now approved, they keep those $716 billion in reductions. They simply don't use them at all for expanding coverage and the other benefits of the Affordable Care Act. They are used for deficit reduction and for financing tax cuts, which is also part of that, uh, of that proposal. So we don't expect it to go very far. It's, um, it's not new. It's very similar to what they did the two prior years before this one. And it just sets the stage for the dialogue with the Senate on a budget resolution we hope will happen. 
So overall, what do you see as the most damaging effects to health and health care of these budget battles in Washington? I don't think we will know. I don't think we know right now which will be the most damaging. I think what we can say categorically is that this is a stupid way to address federal spending. It is in so many respects mindless that you are cutting so many things that people in both parties, inside and outside government, would say that makes absolutely no sense. And yet we've been unable as a society to get our Congress to a place where they could prevent this damage from happening, cutting food inspectors, uh, cutting immunizations, uh, cutting HIV tests. All of these things just make no sense. And it's not just, by the way, my article was about the healthcare sector, but it's also about outside of the healthcare sector. And and I, I read this just, just yesterday, uh, an account, but the Federal Aviation Administration, I mean, people in the health sector fly a lot, right? Beginning next month, they are going to start furloughing the air traffic controllers about one day a month to deal with the impact of this. And so what that means is that planes will be grounded and have to wait longer to take off, not because of congestion at airports, but because there's not enough controllers to do the safe monitoring of the system. And so there's so much in this. You just hear that and you say, well, that's ridiculous. That makes absolutely no sense. And that really, I think, categorizes and describes pretty well what is going on with this sequestration process. It's mindless and it makes absolutely no sense. Thank you, Professor McDonough. Thank you.